Designed in the early 1960s by David Wong and constructed by Kevin Rosland, Nimbus was an early educational digital computer. In use from about 1962, the students of electrical engineering at the University of Sydney were able to practice logical circuit design using Nimbus's unusual and very inventive design. Consisting of many NOR, NAND and JK flip-flop circuits, it was possible to interconnect inputs and outputs of all elements of the machine via a patch panel as the students saw fit. This was to provide training in fundamentals of digital circuits, but Nimbus went a step further with the ability to synthesize a complete digital computer. This enabled experiments in serial synchronous digital systems to be carried out. Simple programs could be run by inserting appropriate pins in the pin board. Many logic circuits were designed to use diode transistor integrated circuit logic and the reconfigurable nature resembled the programming logic of today in the form of PAL, GAL or FPGA ICs. Nimbus is the first educational computer of its kind to be built in Australia, possibly in the world. It's hard to teach digital computing without having something to work on, some practical piece of equipment to demonstrate those, those features. And Nimbus was an excellent machine for that. Nimbus was an educational computer which had the basic elements on panels, logic, or and NOR circuits available and from that you can develop the others. It had all the basic components of a computer. It had an accumulator, instruction register. It had a small programming pin board whereby you could put in, I think it was 16 instructions, so it wasn't obviously uh, able to do any really commercial work. It was only to illustrate the principles. It also had logical elements that were interconnected by plug-in wires. Students could make a simple computer, a simple but complete computer. It was not necessary to actually build the registers, they were already built, they were there. The logic was only that required to interconnect those registers in a certain way to be able to make a, a complete but simple computer. Oh. David Wong initiated that design and it was a very clever piece of work. I guess it is similar to program logic arrays, uh, although they came considerably later than the numerous of course. Certainly you you did patch up the logic, yes, and uh, devised it from your own design and until and uh, all the functions were, were there and thus learned the principles of computing. Uh, there are a couple of flip-flops, JK flip-flops with all the inputs and outputs available. There's some monitor points for monitoring certain signals and then the rest of it is logic, which is OR NOR logic. Several four input gates, mostly four input, and a couple of larger eight input gates at the bottom. And those could be plugged, they're taper pin connections and uh, small leads could be used to connect those with the registers, which were at the, the top section of the computer. Here's one of the registers, an accumulator, and that of course was completely wired. You didn't have to actually wire up a register that was ready to be used and it just had uh, clear and set and clock inputs available to, to drive it. There was no interconnection between the, between the registers. These had no interconnection with the other modules, of which there were about six. The only connections could be made were those between this logic and the already assembled accumulator and instruction register and program counter and memory. It's all, it's all quite clear uh, so they can see exactly what they're, they're doing and what they're, what they're wiring up and there were links to join multiple inputs. There were monitors available as well so they can monitor any point for, for fault finding their own design. Connections are all single taper pin connections. Now were taper pin leads that, that were provided. In Nimbus was controlled from a control panel which had uh, various modes of operation that you, you could select. Test modes which you could run in a single step mode. You could run one word at a time, could clear the memory or in normal operation it would just uh, obey the logic that was wired up. You could sense a particular condition uh, you could run one instruction at a time, step down the pin board, or one phase at a time. There were phases within each, each uh, uh, order, within each operation, and you could monitor those on the, 
on the registers that were, that were available and uh, start or stop the program as required. It was uh, a bit of a job working out how to manufacture it. The uh, logic that was available in those days was actually very high speed RCA logic. And because it was such high speed, we had to take special techniques to ground the, the circuits. And there's a ground plane underneath that goes right across that and plugs into another ground plane at the edge of the computer so that there's a continuous ground plane right across the whole physical size of the machine. The same with the, the registers at the top. They all have a ground plane underneath them. They plug into a ground plane so that the, there's uh, reliable signal connections. It probably would have been better to use lower speed logic but that wasn't available at that time. We had to use what we could get. Every point, both input and output, always has two connections. You can daisy chain along a chain to get as many as you like. And of course, if, if a student exceeded too many points, then the fan out would fail, so the circuit would fail. But it wouldn't damage the, the, the integrated circuit in any way. Every signal on the whole front panel was certainly a logic level signal. No power supplies were available on the front panel. Even if the connections were wrong, it wouldn't do any damage to, the, to any of the circuits. And, and as far as I remember, no integrated circuit ever had to be replaced on that machine. But uh, it finished up being a fairly sound and rugged design, so it couldn't be easily, easily damaged. It had to be student proof. <laughs> it's hard to make something completely student proof, but I think we managed it. Yes, you program Nimbus by putting pins into a pin board that allowed you to put in, I think it was 16 words, 16 instructions that would then be followed by the logic that, that you had developed to produce a result which would only be a result in a set of lights. It would not be any printed after. There were no printer or reader or punch connected to Nimbus. Uh, registers were all 12 bits long, so you could operate on a 12-bit register on 12-bit words and produce a 12-bit result if you needed to do so. But Nimbus had enough basic elements to be able to simulate all parts of a computer. You could actually produce a program that would function and produce a result. It was used for several years. It would have been probably into the early 70s that it was used. From that point, we were using larger scale integrated circuits. And so this level of logic design wasn't something you would, you would do. You worked at a module level rather than at a circuit, individual circuit level. And people still have to do logical design, even in the integrated circuits. The large scale integrated circuits require a lot of logical design and a lot of testing too. So yes, you can still use this scale to do that testing. The latest computers, the very modern computers, still use AND and OR and INVERT and the basic logic that's always been used. That hasn't changed. Nimbus was unique and uh, it certainly has a place in computing in, in Australia and contributed very greatly to uh, instruction in computing and logic techniques. Nimbus was very useful. It certainly did teach the basics of computing very, very well. Several thousand students were abused over a period of years. But Nimbus is probably the first computer that was ever made for specifically for teaching anywhere, and certainly in Australia. I've, I've not heard of any others that have been similar to Nimbus that have ever been built. <laughs>